Hello, my name is Ann Purvis and I'm one of the leaders of the Toronto Field Naturalist Juniors program. It was so awesome together <clears throat> to be together today sharing each other's nature adventures right after a snap snowstorm. These are some pre-snowstorm pictures by Amara from her garden. What an experience to watch beloved plants get all covered with two to four centimeters of snow. I just went out to check on my plants. My daff daffodils have flopped over because the flowers are so big, the stems are bent from the weight of the snow. Most leaves of other plants, however, do not feel frozen, even ones that are six to eight inches high. We had a discussion in the group today about why this might be. It was suggested that snow provides insulation from the cold because it traps warm air close to the plant. So plants are burning sugar to grow and they're giving off waste heat. If that heat can be trapped close to the plant, then that can raise the temperature slightly of the ambient air. This is a lot like building an igloo out of snow in the Arctic, which the snow then acts as insulation and traps the warm air that we're breathing out in the inside the igloo. A lot of the plants in my garden are native plants and it did make me wonder if native plants are adapted to survive these late snowstorms. I wanted to thank everybody for submitting amazing photos this week. Andrew led us on a romp with amphibians last week so I thought we would start with amphibian photos. His slides are still on last week's blog post if anyone wants to refresh their memory. We're going to start with this delightful drawing by Toby of a frog life cycle. Thanks Toby. It reminds me to encourage everyone to use your nature journals during our sessions and out in the field. Notice things and write it down and better still draw it. It actually helps you see more and it helps you remember more. Marina and Sonia were at Courtright Conservation Area in Rouge Park this past week and saw some amazing things. It stimulated me to want to get out this weekend to Courtright perhaps. Sonia saw this creature. Anyone guess what it is? I believe it is a late stage eft. If you remember, the red newt larva lives on land, but as it matures it starts to darken down get the paddle-like tail, and then it returns to water to become an adult. This creature doesn't have the red spots of the eastern newt adult that I can see, so that's why I think it's probably a larva that perhaps recently returned to the water. Newts will live in lots of different ponds. It is still very early in the season, so this huge tadpole must have overwintered here. There's no way that it grew from an egg to this size in such a short time. My guess is that it is a tadpole of a green frog, since it is a little darker. You can also see spots on the clear fins of the tail. The tail is also long and skinny, kind of snake-like, which distinguishes it from the bullfrog tail. The bullfrog is also tends to be a bit lighter in color. I don't see any sign of the legs here, so I'm guessing that this has got still quite a lot of maturing to do before it becomes a frog. So Sonia is holding um, red-backed salamanders here. Someone guessed these, these might be the red efts. Uh, these are red-backed salamanders, and they're the only salamanders that are completely independent of water. So they lay their eggs in stumps of trees um, or suspended from the ceiling of a cavity in a tree stump. And the egg serves as a little pond for the maturing salamander larva. So the little larva inside there have the external gills and they, they swim around just like a tadpole larva would in, in a regular pond. Evelyn provided this cool photo uh, on the left of a chocolate painted on a pansy and this is one way to eat. It is possible to eat violets, uh, which a pansy is a violet, and they can also be used to decorate salads. It is still very early in spring and these flowers are all blooming. Where do we find these flowers? These are forest floor flowers. We can see the dead leaves and the stumps of logs 
These flowers bloom in the spring at a time when there's no leaves on the trees so that the plants can grow quickly and mature. These plants will completely disappear later on in the season. So these are what we call spring ephemerals. The one on the left is beautiful spring beauty. In the middle we have uh, trillium and on the right trout lily. The question is, if they're blooming now, do they have some kind of association with insects that are around at this time? The answer is yes. Sebastian sent in these beautiful photos of mining bees, which are our earliest ground nesting native bees to be out and about. These are the Eastern cellophane bee. We have seen these on a couple of outings that we've been on as junior naturalists. So they dig burrows in ground, in the ground, line them with cellophane, fill them with pollen from early flowers, birch, willow, and maple flowers as well, and then lay an egg inside. The TFN juniors have found these in hydro cuts where the soil is sandy. Thanks to Sebastian for these photos. The ant photo on the right intrigues me. It looks to me like the very tiny black ants are farming the large red pupa-like creature. I will keep investigating, but I couldn't figure out what this was. So we have two kinds of turtles here. The one on the left is the wonderful well-known landings turtle with the bright yellow throat and this is being reintroduced into many parts of Ontario. It's, it's kind of been extirpated in some places. So these photos were taken at Rouge Park and I believe that the zoo has been reintroducing them into the Rouge River. The turtles on the right are painted turtles. We can see from the little red marks um, along their shell. So we discussed um, in this photo which is a reptile and which is a mollusk and how do we know which is which and what's the difference between them. So the reptile is the garter snake on the left and reptiles have an internal skeleton like mammals. So they are vertebrates. The slug on the right is a mollusk. So most slugs have an external shell which their internal organs are attached to. Slugs have lost that over over time and all that they have left is uh, what's called a mantle on the outside and the mantle kind of protects their internal organs and provides uh, opportunities for water to get inside to remove waste materials and to bring in oxygen and to circulate food. I thought one cool thing I learned about slugs is that it has two pair of antenna. We can see the one pair and those top pair have eyes, but there's another pair underneath that are used for smelling. And I think they are slightly visible on the picture on the right. Thank you, Amara, for the pictures of the slug and Evelyn for the picture of the garter snake. So this last section of our slideshow is dedicated to birds, which is what we're focusing on with Ken Vogan later in the session today. This is a drawing by Sonia. Thank you so much, Sonia. So Sonia and her mom saw these great blue herons in mating out at Courtright Conservation Area. So this looks like one nest. It's actually two nests. Uh, the nest on the right, uh, the one great blue heron is looking off in the distance. And the bird in the middle is the female and the bird on the left is the male. So the male climbs up on the female's back and she spreads her wings out like this. And this is now the female appears to have left the nest. So we asked you to try and collect bird calls um, as a preparation for today for, for Ken's presentation on bird language. And Toby and Natasha sent in this. So we asked Toby what he thought the robin was communicating and he thought maybe the robin was shouting to his siblings, to his sisters and brothers or friends that he was there, which was a, an excellent guess. And we decided to leave it with that um, because ben, um, Ken is going to be giving us more ideas about what birds might be communicating uh, during his presentation. 
So this is one of our earliest sparrows to arrive in Ontario. It is a song sparrow. It has such a distinctive call. To mark their territory, song sparrows usually sit in one spot singing over and over again. Then they move to another spot and sing some more. During the incubation of the eggs, the male will sing to tell the female she can leave the nest and go foraging for food. So this was a tricky photo. These are cowbirds sitting up here on the solar collector and a really wonderful close-up of a cowbird in this bush here. I had jumped to the conclusion that this was a cowbird bringing nesting material, but it didn't really make sense because cowbirds don't build nests. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and give other birds the job of raising their young. This turns out to be a starling with red legs and uh, whitish wings underneath. And so the starling must be building a nest somewhere near the solar collectors and I'm sure that any female cowbirds that are around are keeping a very close eye on where that nest is and whether it would be useful for laying cowbird eggs in there. So our final two photos, uh, two videos, were um, of Coots Paradise in Hamilton and where we had the privilege of visiting recently and I gave the kids a challenge of how many birds they could actually hear, how many different song bird calls or songs they could hear in these videos. So I hear five in there. I hear red winged blackbird, blue jay, a mallard duck, a song sparrow, and a yellow shafted flicker. In the yellow shafted flicker, we noticed it flying from tree to tree and singing in different trees. <laughs> 